Well, first, Holmes was born. Then he got fat, bald, and tired, tired, tired. What's up, Holmes? Beware, your host, Jonathan Holmes. Jesus, Sinistar, that was abrasive. When are you going to learn to talk to people? Nice. You are such a harsh man, uh, or whatever you are. There's steely gaze, terrifying. You know who has a warm, embracing gaze? It's Tom Hewlett. Tom, is that you? Warm, embracing gaze. <laughs> That's pretty, pretty warm. Did I pronounce your name properly? I've never said it out loud. I've only read it. I believe so. Tom Hewlett. Tom that sounds Hewlett. like me. Yeah. Thank you, Tom. And you have been working on video games for many years. Maybe so as long. many. Yeah. When did when did you start in the video games? Um, I I think it was 21 years ago. When I was wow. 12, which is a cool <laughs> reverse number thing. So that's that's a bonus. Yeah. That's a mirror image of yourself. So yeah. 21 years ago, you started in video games at age... What? How did you get a job in video games at age 12? Who hired you? Who thought 12-year-olds? Well, that's who we need. <laughs> well, uh, we, we moved uh, to Orange County when I was 10, and it was near a guy who worked for Virgin Games. And he found out I could get further in Battletoads than anybody at Virgin. And they had a thing making games that were too hard for little kids. So they huh. brought me in to prove these aren't too hard for little kids. Here's a 12-year-old that can beat them. They're fine. <laughs> That's amazing. Uh, so it was through knowing people. Was that a, a paying job? The, the it was. Job? I came in uh, once a week, and I got paid, I don't even remember what, $8 an hour or something. And uh, I got to test uh, Aladdin and Global Gladiators out of this world. And Whoa. other games, yeah. Did you get to be behind the scenes at all? Like, see the developers or, or talk yeah. to them directly? Uh, Dave Perry locked me in his office once on accident, so that was cool. Uh, he forgot I was in there. I'm sure he was busy uh, doing important Dave Perry things, but uh, not a lot of people can say that. I hope. I, I mean, maybe people can. <laughs> maybe there's a help what group out I there. <laughs> what was what was? Do you remember what he was working on at the time? Uh, uh, it was it was gl the... Global Gladiators. I I think I was supposed to prove how quickly someone could beat it. I think, but I ended up beating it like three times because I was stuck in there. So, <laughs> what are you gonna do? Just beat the oh, game right. again. Did, did they adjust the uh, the difficulty after that, as you recall? I don't think so. I think it was that was probably late. That was like a last check, like. Is this going to take kids forever, or is someone going to blow through it in a half hour sort of sure. test? Yeah. So they, they knew that a boy locked in a room would like it enough to play it three times and <laughs> right. could do that if he wanted to. and get It was a helpful work. test, yeah. Yeah, they should have put that on the box. Boys locked in rooms love it. Uh, so you <laughs> – so how did that affect your mentality towards video games, your feeling towards them, to have them – go from what you do instead of work to something you had to do, uh, whether you wanted to or not, pretty early on. That's something that's affected me. Now I write about video games, so I feel differently about them because oftentimes I have to play them whether I want to or not. Uh, people who develop video games often feel that way. But at 12, it's kind of like you had your innocence taken from you <laughs> right away before you are even 13. Video games ruined me. Yeah, and I, I just spent that money on more video games. So, you know, I'd, I'd go home and, and buy Street Fighter 2 on the way home from Virgin and then play that all week. So that's so probably it, it messed me up. You out on. Yeah, you, you didn't, it didn't tinge your attitude towards video games in any way to, uh, to have them become a job so early on. No, I mean, it was still pretty fun. And I had ridiculous things like kids in junior high would make fun of me because I got paid to play video games, which doesn't make a whole lot of sense. But that, in its own way, that prepared me for my career as well, having people badmouth me for no reason. Yeah, because you, you in your, you have been sort of front and center in a, for a lot of the companies you've worked for, which is a, a difficult position. It can be an exciting position, I imagine, but you become the scapegoat and the brunt, the, the face that gets the tomatoes thrown at it, 
when the guy's backstage may be doing something that the audience doesn't like. Is that fair enough to say? Yeah, it can it can be that way. Yeah. Yeah, or it can be really great. A lot of people to you're the toast of the town with many people, particularly for your work on Shattered Memories, which we'll be getting to sooner rather than later. But you started at Virgin, you continued through school, you didn't become a video game dropout and just become <laughs> a junkie on Battletoads and Global Gladiators. You got through school and then you went to college? Yeah, as people do. But uh, I wanted to do more than just go to school because I don't like school very much. Mm -hmm. uh, it's kind of boring. So <laughs> stay in school, kids. Um, <laughs> but uh, I decided to sort of start my own video game company because, you know, I tested games when I was 12. How hard could this be? Uh, it turns out it's pretty hard. But uh, So I started Team Excalibur uh, with a friend of mine, and we found a bunch of people on the Internet who would mostly work for free and convinced them to make an RPG on Game Boy Color. And we actually what got licensed... Hmm? What, what year was that, and how do you this spell was, Excalibur? Uh, X-K-A-L-I-B-U-R. Excalibur. Like in Final Fantasy Legend when they didn't have a lot of characters. Boom. Holy crap, was that actually from Final Fantasy Legend that you spelled it that way? Maybe. Now that I think about it, that might have been an unintentional truth bomb, guys. That is so good. And uh, around what year was that? 98? 98, 99? All right. So you were well out of high school. Um, done with college at that point? No, no. I was just starting college. Just starting college, and you thought, also, video game company, we can do it. Run you got that. licensed for Game Boy Color? Yeah. I don't know how that happened, because I've spoken to developers since that have a lot of trouble getting licensed by Nintendo. Mm. I guess they were feeling generous at the time, but uh, we were like official. Did yeah, you that, have an well, office? Yeah. We didn't have an office, <laughs> and I right. think that's one of the requirements, so I don't know what I must have said to impress them. Awesome. Do you remember, did you have a phone call or an email, or how did you... Yeah, we did a bunch of emails and phone calls, and they made sure I had a fax number. I remember that. And fortunately, my dad did have a fax. So, I don't know, man. Faxes are cool. It, <laughs> <laughs> that is amazing. Happen. I'm trying to, to bite my... I can't imagine who... Because I was once that age, and I wanted to make a video game. But I would have never had the guts to actually call Nintendo and not stop at, like, the first hang-up or the stop at the first <laughs> roadblock, but you kept going. Do you remember who you talked to at Nintendo at that point? Um, Sandy Hatcher, I think. She's really nice. I met her years later. She's a sweetheart, and she remembered oh. me. She was like, oh, you're that Team Excalibur guy. <laughs> That's amazing. That, there should be a movie about yeah. just that. <laughs> If you ask me, does she still work in the industry, Sandy Hatcher? I don't know. This, I I met her um, when the Wii was coming out because they had a, had me go in for for Trauma Center and sort mm -hmm. of be like, "Here's the Wii, and it's really sweet. And imagine what you can do with it." So that was 2006. So. And she was still there at Nintendo yeah. at that time. People awesome. liked the working at Nintendo. I have heard that. Who I've knew, heard... right? Like Nintendo. <laughs> they are a shadowy company. Uh, much as I feel Valve is becoming slowly, where people, they are so big and everyone's thinking about them all the time, which it seems to make them want to tell people even less about their inner working. So people are constantly guessing right. as to uh, how they think behind the lines. But, uh, but uh, speaking of Trauma Center, you designed the controls on Trauma Center Second Opinion, is that right? Yes. Um, after that meeting with Nintendo, I, I, I really liked the Wii a lot, as most of us did. And uh, I got really far on their Metroid demo, I was told, when I was there. There was a Metroid demo? Yeah, to show it off. To, they made a Metroid Prime 2 with the Wii controls, and they were like, look how sweet Metroid would be. Oh, and wow. I guess I did well. Anyway, so on the way home, I thought, there's got to be a cool thing to do with surgery. And so I came up with using the nunchuck to select tools and then the Wii remote to use tools. And the... Uh, the guys at Atlas Japan liked it enough to use it in the game, so I was super proud of that. So you not only designed it, but you came up with the idea to even do it in the first place? Yeah. Wow. And it all kind of comes back to you being good at video games and somehow getting yourself behind the scenes 
at companies and people being, I guess, just liking you as a person too. That probably doesn't hurt. Those I, virgin I guys so. wouldn't like if there was a, a farty, snotty, annoying twelve-year-old. They wouldn't want him around to test the games. That must be yeah. Weird, Don't give him money. Games. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I jumped around a little bit. I apologize. So Team Excalibur, you were going to make an RPG for the Game Boy Color, but I'm guessing that didn't work out. Is that right? No. So it turns out you need a publisher. Well, you don't anymore, but you did back then. And uh, we had some trouble convincing. We had a like an upstart publisher, but they disappeared. So then we thought, how do we find a publisher? And we decided to do an online petition. Because if there's one thing kids should learn, it is that all online petitions work every time. <laughs> and this is, is this around 1999 or 2000? Yeah, I think it, maybe 2000. Of? And so oh. we had the uh, Help Mithri Find a Publisher petition. And we got about 4,000 signatures. Thank you very much, everybody. Hmm. And that didn't get us a publisher. <laughs> um, I, well, someone did, did you shop it around to, to publishers and show them the petition? or? Yeah, after the petition, we got, I forget who it was. It was a PC publisher. And they contacted us. And we said, oh, you're going to publish our game? And they said, no. But good job getting the petition. Good for you. Uh, so that was cool. Not helpful, but cool. And then another friend with a publisher approached me and said they would publish it, and that went on for a couple of years, and then that fell through too. But at one point we shopped it around to Atlas, and so I used my contacts there and said, hey, do you guys need QA, or what do you need? And they said, we'd hire you to do QA. So I became Atlas QA. And then I think the second week I was there, they said, we just fired a localization editor. Now we don't know who's going to localize Robopon 2. And I just raised my hand and was really annoying. And so they let me do it. How do you, did you know how to localize a thing? Um, yeah, I was an English major in college. Okay. And uh, I'd taken some Japanese, enough Japanese to understand sort of the structure of the language. And once it was translated, even if it was translated really poorly, I could take that and make it good English. So huh, interesting. I don't know if so, Atlas knew that at the time, but I had a feeling I knew it at the time, and uh, it worked out okay. Huh. What? How did you do? No, you don't just do that. People just, you're like the office space guy. You just walk in. You've got a big fish, and you throw it on your desk and start gutting it, and everyone's like, "Well, he seems pretty confident about it. <laughs> Let's just let him do it. He put this must be good." And then what you end up making actually is good when you got the fish. Never localized a game before, and they just threw you right on Robopon Two. Yeah, a big a big profile title like Robopon Two. <laughs> <laughs> well, which, I remember Robopon Two, which was actually guy was, yeah. developed by the team that did Illusion of Gaia. Quintet, so that's kind of cool. That's very cool. I thought the character design was good. I thought he was a cute little guy. It was kind of a platformy, dodging bullets sort of a time, wasn't it? Listen, this was the RPG one. Oh, I think I mixed it up with Robo Kid too. Could yeah. I am the worst. What is Robo Pond too then? I'm it's sorry. it's a Pokemon ripoff. With it's robots. Pokemon, Robo Pond, huh? <laughs> Huh? So, yeah, with robots. So you could. But like, that's a lot more to localize than if it was uh, an RPG than yeah. what I was thinking of. What? How'd the translation turn out? Now, when you look back on it, um, um, the it was good English. It was probably a little bit unprofessional. Not not like I was like cursing or anything, but it, you know, it just comes off a little bit shaky. But hey, I was like twenty. Give me a break. Oh, you you get all the breaks for me. I'm 100% <laughs> impressed. I can't believe you pulled because I took, you know, a semester or two of Japanese in college. We have a lot of parallels, actually. Now that I think about it, and I would have never had the guts to to do it. And uh, but you were right. As long as the finished product is enjoyable to by the people who are playing it in English, if there's some discrepancies or, or a little bit of lack of uh, full translation or accurate translation. I imagine it wouldn't make a big difference as long as the finished product is pretty good. Yep. Though these days, you could never get away with it. If you were to, let's say, translate Persona 3 
and not do it just right, someone would catch you on it and want to kill you. A lot of someone. Persona ones. fans. <laughs> and did you end up working on Persona 3? Did I read that correctly? Yeah, Persona 3 was the final game I worked on at Atlas. Well, I worked on Trauma Center Second Opinion after it, but it came out after that game. So Persona 3 is, I guess, the last game I worked on at Atlas. I, wor- I wrote some of the social link text. Oh, cool. That's some of, some of uh, people's favorite stuff, the part that resonates with people emotionally in that game is the overall storyline and, of course, the social link stuff. So yeah. when you were playing, uh, I mean, when you were working on Persona 3, did you have the feeling that that might be the start of something bigger? Uh, and uh, do you think it was? From my perspective, I hadn't really heard of the Persona series. I knew the, the overall series, the Shin Megami Tensei. I think I said yeah. that right. Uh, mm-hmm. I knew the series. I'd always heard about it as being like having penis monsters and being like Pokemon <laughs> except for Satan worshippers, which I thought, that sounds pretty neat. But Persona took it to another level in terms of having a style that was so embraced by certain people um, in the West, it was really, it fed them something I think they were missing for a while, something that they used to feel like they were getting from the Final Fantasy series with stylish characters, interesting, unpredictable storyline, and it came right along when the Final Fantasy series, for a lot of people, is drying up creatively, and then Persona hits with this really fresh style. Uh, That's how I felt about it anyway. How did you feel about the game, and what did you think it was going to end up yeah, Doing so of... the first time I saw it, um, they'd flown me out to Japan for Tokyo Game Show, and so it was kind of touring the Atlas office and showing what they were working on behind the scenes. And they were like, oh, here's this game we're kind of just starting. It's, it's the third Persona game. Check it out. And there wasn't a lot to see, and I was like, what's this? It's on PS2, and, and you know, I guess I guess it's okay. And then I didn't see anything on it for a long time. And then, um, like, E3 that year or something, it was in Famitsu, and they did this huge media thing, and they played the intro with the music, and they had all this footage, and I was like, whoa, that's not the game I saw before. This looks pretty sweet. I want to work on that game. And then I got to do a little bit on it, went to Konami, and then Persona 3 came out, and I got to play it as as a player who didn't necessarily know everything about the game, and it blew me away. I love Persona. It's Now it's one of my favorite RPG series, and um, it's great. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, were you shocked at all when you saw the shooting yourselves in the head and uh, <laughs> colors coming out stuff? That must have... It shocked me when I saw it, but I was impressed with how brave it was, and I didn't feel, didn't feel like a Western uh, developer might have gone that way uh, because it's so off-putting. Yeah. In our culture, but uh, but in Japanese culture, maybe isn't so much. Um, but yeah, what did you first think of that when you saw it? It was it was shocking. It, mm-hmm. They'd actually called us, the Japan had called the U.S. and asked about. There's a scene where where they're like strung up on crucifix type things, mm-hmm. and they said, "Is this is this kosher for the West?" And I said, "No, not so much. Uh, maybe take off the top of the cross so it's like a T. That's a little mm-hmm. bit better. It's still mm-hmm. kind of shaky." So I think I don't know I don't even remember if they did or did not remove that. But then they sh- I saw this gun thing and I was like, well, "Why didn't you ask about the gun thing? That seems even worse than the crucifix thing." Um, but you get used to it. That sounds terrible, doesn't it? You get used to it and you stop thinking about it like they're shooting themselves in the head. I don't think it sounds terrible at all because it, <laughs> <laughs> cause I, I think it's uh, really interesting and it's not like encouraging people to shoot themselves in the head or anything. It's, um, it's using shocking language to talk about something kind of real and that's rare in video games. It's getting less rare, which is nice, yeah. um, but it, it, at the time, PS2 era was even more rare back then. And I'm surprised more people didn't talk about it. I never heard about it on Fox News or whatever, but yeah. um, I certainly was impressed and with Persona 4. But you were saying after Persona 3, and and we should wrap up a little bit on what overall you did at Atlas, just in case uh, people are curious. I know that I am. You worked on Trauma Center, Second Opinion, Trauma Center, New Blood, uh, Persona 3. Not New Blood? 
No, not new blood. I was uh, oh, I was uh, under the knife. Oh, sorry. And then second opinion. Gotcha. Okay. Under the knife was the, the first DS one. Game. Yeah. Yeah. And um, you worked on River City Ransom as well while you yes. were there, right? That, yeah, that was a big... That's I thought, I've peaked. This is the pinnacle of my career. River City Ransom, this is amazing. I'm going to make the homeboys say bizarf instead of barf. <laughs> did, you, did you do that? I that's me. Gone back and... Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's... I had to go back and play it. Uh, I, I don't have... I've got a 3DS handy. I don't have a... GBA compatible console handy at the moment, so I didn't go back and play it. But that is pretty amazing. You changed it to Bizarf. Bizarf, yeah. See, because they're homeboys, huh? See, that's that's the secret of good localization, right there. How did you? I love River City Ransom a lot. <laughs> I would have been scared as hell to make any changes to it. But it sounds like you. I'll just tell you what I think of you so far. It seems as though you have a playful confidence that allows you to put ideas out there. And then in the end, you're not the, the head of these companies. So if they don't want it, they don't have to do it. But you're like, hey, I got an idea of Bizarre. And if they go for it, then, then you did a thing. You got to try. But with River City Ransom, I guess in the process of, of localizing it, I found out there's this huge backstory to all the Kunio characters, and those guys are in every game. And we didn't get that here because the games were released. Some of them were really localized American, and some of them were kept really Japanese. So we didn't get that, oh, these are all the same guys. Oh, these guys have allegiances to each other, or friendships, or rivalries. Uh, like Alex and Ryan in River City Ransom aren't even friends. They're kind of rivals that have to work together in that game. And so I wanted to make sure that that came across. And we had the same number of lines as the original River City Ransom, but I had to find a way to get across all that Japanese nuance in the limited text we had. So the only way to do that was to put Bizarre in there. <laughs> <laughs> well, I can't wait to play that again now. Um, I really wish that would come to the 3DS Virtual Console or something along those lines. Uh, That'd be I know sweet. Yeah, you don't have... Do you still have friends over there that you can beg to do things for me? Yeah, I, I beg friends to do stuff all the time. I do. Well, we should make a list together. I'll beg my friends, you can beg yours. And Nick Marigos, make it happen, buddy. Is he at Atlas? He's at Atlas. Awesome. Yeah, do they still... Do you think they still own the River City Ransom uh, license? That's a good question. Yeah. Axis might. Axis has done some stuff with... Yeah, I'll have Maybe. to look into that. Cause Come they on, did Axis. Make... They made that, uh, I don't know if you saw it, the 3DS got a remake of the first of Renegade, I think. But with oh, the did Red it? City Ransom. Yeah, it did. And it, it's got four-player multiplayer, and since it's 3DS, <laughs> it's got, um, you know, it's sprite-based graphics still, but there's uh, that kind of depth effect and whatnot. It looked great, and then it never came out here. That was like a year and a half ago, two years. Well, call the guy. Uh, yeah, yeah, please call him. I'll make some please. calls. So uh, after Atlas, you're at Konami, and how did you start there? So uh, Atlas was great. Um, I loved the, the atmosphere and sort of what I was doing, but I wanted to make games, not just localize other people's games. Mm -hmm. And so Konami had a position open for an associate producer, and I love Konami, you know, Metal Gear and everything, Silent Hill, mm -hmm. Castlevania, Contra, you name it. The Konami is great. They're my company. So I had to try, and I actually got the job somehow. And then I, then I was at Konami. And what was uh, your first game at Konami? Uh, my first game, well, I was briefly on Winx Club, which is a licensed game about a European cartoon. Winx uh, I was with, an X, with an X. Oh, yeah. That's uh, so good, because you're the Excalibur guy. Right. But Thought unfortunately, I was only on Winx Club for about a week. And then they said, we're going to do some reshuffling. Uh, this isn't working. Tom, you're going to be on Contra and Silent Hill. Uh, and I said, I said, well, you know, I want to finish up this Winx thing. This is, why would I go to Contra and Silent Hill? That doesn't make any sense. But they talked me into it, and I was on Contra and Silent Hill. Contra Hi, 4. Hi, Contra oh, 4. Yeah. That happens to me all the time, too. 
What's your? Oh, I had a cat just like that once, except he was fatter and had like eight paws. What's your cat? <laughs> this is Misery. She's named after the cave story villainous witch. Pretty awesome. Yeah, the uh, the floating, pale skinned, blue haired lady. Yep. Uh, so you started on Contra 4 first? Yeah. Um, so somehow I got in there at the perfect time for a guy who wanted to make games. And they were taking pitches for new games. And I pitched a bunch of weird stuff like Silent Hill for Wii. That would never work. Uh, and my buddy Simon Lai pitched Contra Revival or, or like new, new Super Mario Brothers Contra. Like, hey, let's bring back the retro. This might be a thing. Mm-hmm. And so they put us on that together. And I'd, I'd known Matt Bozon from Way Forward, so I, of course, said, hey, Way Forward should definitely be the developer for a retro Contra. And that magically happened. So we got Contra 4. Thank you. So, <laughs> because I freaking love that game. Though I'm surprised uh, that some Contra fans don't like it, and I'm still puzzled. Yeah, isn't that Who really? are these fans? Uh, they, some of them even work for Destructoid. They, no, nobody says it's bad, or very rarely anyone says it's bad, but they're like, it's good, but it's, you know, it's like Contra, you know? And I'm like, yeah, the, I like that. And they're like, yeah, I just wanted something a little different. Uh, which speaks to the psychology behind uh, fans who have had a series in their life for a long time. And they're, uh, I've been meaning to write an article about this. I don't know if you know about Capgrass syndrome. Do you know about that syndrome? No, explain it. it. It's a neurological syndrome also. Uh, wake, you know, makes its way into a lot of psychological and psychiatric illnesses. So Capgrass is when the... Uh, you know, there's chemicals that fire when you talk to a loved one, like a familiar person. Mm-hmm. Um, there's a feeling that happens sometimes on a subconscious level where you recognize them emotionally to be the person you've known for a long time. And uh, Capgrass is when you don't get that feeling, when, the, when that doesn't happen uh, biochemically. And oftentimes, if there's already the potential for a neurological or psychiatric disorder, the person will then come up with an explanation on a subconscious level as to why they're not getting that feeling such as oh that's not really my dad that's like an imposter that's just a very realistic dad mask they're wearing or if they're more psychotic they'll think oh they're a robot or they're a zombie or they're a devil or something along those lines and it's something I see happen in video games a whole lot where someone will have this emotional attachment to a series like Contra or like Silent Hill and then a new entry in the series will come out, and they'll feel like it, it, it looks right, it sounds right, it's it got the, the mythologies there, everything's there, but it just doesn't feel right. I hate it. And then they'll hate the person who, they, they won't just be like, oh, it wasn't my favorite. They'll be like, I hate whoever made that so much. They killed my game. Oh, they killed my childhood and freak out hard on you. A lot of people do it to Nintendo, because Nintendo. They haven't changed in the same ways that their players have changed over the past right. 25 years in some cases. So they'll be like, oh, it doesn't feel right. Uh, they should all be fired. And I feel like it happened to you quite a bit on the, the Silent Hill series. So I'd want to get to that. What did you do on the Silent Hill games, and uh, how did that go over? Sorry, I, I want you to go write that article now. Forget this podcast. <laughs> That's fascinating. One of these days I'll do it, but it's uh, it's hard to... When I think about, a little bit more about me, when I think about writing something like that, I'm like, 50 people will love it. 10,000 people will be incredibly insulted by the fact that I just said they have a neurological disorder. And then everyone else will just think that I think I'm a know-it-all and ignore it. So it's, it's hard to win on those uh, Smarty Pants articles. But anyway, Silent Hill. What was your first game there? So I came in, again, as a Silent Hill fan, uh, I've been playing it since the first game. I loved it. And and sort of when I came to Konami, just to back up a little bit, I thought, you know, what are my goals here? What do I want to accomplish? And I said, I want to try to work on a Contra game in some fashion. Uh, and this is because it's, you know, I'd love to work on Castlevania, but that was like up here, and there's no way that would ever happen. Mm-hmm. Uh, so let's aim realistically. Contra's cool. I'd like to work on Contra. I'd like to revive Rocket Knight because Rocket Knight's awesome and should be revived. 
and maybe on some off chance I will work on Silent Hill one day. So the fact that a month after that I was working on Contra and Silent Hill was kind of really intimidating. And they put me on, well, it, the, the Silent Hills being made at the time were Origins, which had just been shifted from the U.S. team that was making a really weird game to the, U, the U.K. team at Climax, mm -hmm. who made the Origins we ultimately played. And then they were also working on Homecoming. And I was a Silent Hill fan, and they'd put me on some... Silent Hill games that were going in different directions mm. so I didn't react super great and I may have yelled at a team about Pyramid Head not belonging in the game so uh, in Homecoming? yeah so you know Silent Hill fans I've been there man I've, I've been that guy and uh, you know you, you can only do your best for a franchise like mm. there's, there's games are made by hundreds of people it's not just like Tom Hewlett could have changed this. He just didn't care. It's it's not just my vision. It's the producer's vision and the developer's vision and everyone on the developer's staff vision. You're all contributing to the game in some way. So I did my so best. Know, so I'm clear. What was your, your technical role? On my role was uh, associate producer. And at Konami, the producers really have a lot of a lot more creative control than at a lot of companies, which is why I like being at Konami and wanted to go to Konami. But, uh, you know, and not to be like, I was the guy that knew what I was talking about, everyone else, not I'm not saying that. Like, everybody on the game wanted to make the best Silent Hill game they possibly could. And they all work whatever that was to them, that's what they were working toward. So you can't make everybody happy. And a lot of and people. When there's a hundred of you, yeah, sure. and a lot of people loved it. Yeah, our uh, our biggest Silent Hill fans, uh, Destructoid, are Jim Sterling, and at the time was Colette Bennett, who has gone on to do a lot of different things. And I believe she reviewed Homecoming for the site. Oh, and Dale North, her editor in chief, loves Silent Hill, uh, and they really enjoyed Homecoming. They said that there's some use of the myths and the the archetypal characters that are maybe different than you would think that it had a little bit of a fan artish feel to it but it was awesome it was fun to play and it gave you the feeling and it you know, told a legitimate story and uh gave you the creeps so it was a good silent hill game um and, and that's how i felt about it as well for the most part uh but people did you get a lot of that or did you get a lot of Hate and 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 all more maybe more importantly, how did it go over within Konami when that game came out? How did how did they react internally? Well, so my sort of constant role on Silent Hill was I was like the fan guy, mm -hmm. so I I was the one that knew all the lore, I knew all the characters, I knew what they meant and all their symbolism and why this was that way and why the original team did these things, and so it was kind of. Then we got people also involved that weren't that which new thing. Silence actually, because if I just did what the fans wanted, meaning what I wanted, it wouldn't be evolving. Mm -hmm. But then if they just took it and evolved it, it would be abandoning all these things. So we were all working together to sort of make the best Silent Hill game that, you know, survival horror has been struggling this whole generation about what are we? Are we action games? Are we point-and-click adventure games? What do we do? And so it was nice on Silent Hill that they let me keep it rooted in what it was, but we had people who would tell me to shut up and like push it forward in new directions too. Mm -hmm. And you know, every game isn't the perfect balance, but I think with like Downpour, I really think that we balanced it with old versus new. Um, there's a lot of stuff there for modern gamers who want, you know, the the conveniences that they're got, they've gotten used to in games. But then there's still that mysterious, weird, clunky combat feel that I think is part of survival horror. Mm -hmm. So yeah, the I don't remember what you asked, but I rambled for a while. Oh, that's okay. No, you done you done good. Uh, I'm really curious as to what your take on 
Panami's perspective on Silent Hill was, what they expected out of it, what they how they felt after the games were released. I don't know how much you feel good about talking about. Of course, if there's anything you don't want to touch on, don't worry about that. But but it's an interesting series in that it's very high profile. It's got two films out. Everyone's heard of it. Everyone knows about it. But when I look back on what I can find in terms of sales data, I've rarely seen any of the games in the series sell a ton. I, I think... Silent Hill 2 and 3, from what I uh, vaguely remember, sold some of the best. And then from there, it's always been kind of a hundreds of thousands kind of series as opposed to a million sort of series. And I wondered if Konami knew that or felt that that's how it should be or if they were disappointed when they would, didn't become blockbusters or, or and also why uh, the series tends to change kind of a lot. So it's a lot of questions. Not any specific one you have to answer, but just touching on that stuff in general, I'd love to hear what you know. Yeah, Silent Hill's been a weird series, as far as I can tell. Um, Again, being in the American side, I've only heard things from what went on in Japan, but it seems like the team that made the original to begin with was sort of this, like, we don't know what to do with you guys. Go off in the corner and figure it out. I don't know, make a Resident Evil game. Uh, Knock yourselves out. So they sort of, you know, looked deep within themselves or just watched a, The Shining a bunch of times. I don't know. Uh, but they came up with this this horror game that re- resonated with people. Not a ton of people, but, you know, people. Mm. And then that became a series. And they've all kind of... They, none of them have been, like, super blockbuster, Metal Gear, everyone's played Silent Hill, who owns a PS2 or anything. Mm. But... You know, obviously Konami wanted it to be a big blockbuster because they kept making them. And that's why it's kind of... It always... In my darkest of dark days when the internet hated me, uh, I always like thought it was interesting and comforting in that, well, Konami isn't forcing this game to be... They're not saying, look at Dead Space, make Dead Space. Mm-hmm. Dead Space sold more than us. This has to be like Dead Space. And then I would I would have said, if they'd ever said that, which they didn't, I would have said, well, no, it's Silent Hill. It can't be Dead Space. It's, mm-hmm. It has to be, you know, this, you know, everyday protagonist in a crazy situation, blah, 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 blah. Mm-hmm. But they never said that. It was always, this is Silent Hill. Uh, you know what it's about. Make one that makes money. And none of them were great big blockbuster Metal Gear hits, but uh, none of them were sell out this is an action game now type things mm-hmm. opinions sure. might vary if you if you pull the internet on that but i personally don't feel we ever made it a not silent hill game book of memories notwithstanding that wasn't supposed to be like the other games so of course that one was different yeah book of memories was a guidance sort of a alternate take like on... a side story yeah is that what guidance means Maybe it is guidance? Yep. Okay. Ninja side story, but there wasn't a first one. <laughs> and in the arcade, you just punch uh, Jason in the face. Until they chainsaw it. you to death. <laughs> what a weird game. Yeah, Ninja Gaiden arcade. Anyway, uh, <clears throat> for me, Silent Hill has always been, these are slightly unglued, really creative people that are going to surprise me. And only two and three, I would say, was there any sort of feeling of like, oh, I kind of know what to expect from two to three. And then The Room came out, and I was like, what was that? And then Origins, Homecoming, uh, Shattered Memories, every single time, it for me, it felt right, because it felt like slightly unglued people taking risks and being creative and trying to make me uncomfortable, regardless. So the consistency for me has always been the lack of predictability, which which works. And I hope they continue to do that, though I haven't heard much about Silent Hill since you left Konami. I don't know if I. Anything. I, yeah, hope, I hope there's more, because I would like to play it as a fan again. It would sure. be weird. It'll be weird, I'm sure, that I'll be like, oh, I wouldn't have done that, or whatever. <laughs> well, yeah. But, uh, yeah you could help it. Um, I don't want the series to die, either. I yeah. would like it to be keep going. And the the last one was Downpour. No, it was Book of Memories, right? Yeah. The last the last core game was Downpour, and then mm-hmm. Book of Memories is kind of a celebration of everything. 
And with yeah. the DLC, uh, I know Ad when Adam was on your podcast, he said uh, we tried to fit in something that referenced everything in the series. Like, you couldn't find any corner that had gone unturned. And with the DLC that came out a month ago, uh, there's nothing. We've we filled in all the holes. There's something for no matter how obscure your favorite Silent Hill thing is, it's in Book of Memories. So now you have to buy it. That's so good. How much is the DLC? Do you know? Five bucks, I think. It's pretty cheap. That's nothing. Yeah, it's like a burger. <laughs> a good burger. A delicious burger. Uh, Shattered Memories. I had feelings about it. I don't. I want to be nice because I don't want to be a jerk to you. I like you, and I like Shattered Memories, but I had my own agenda for that game. Okay. I came into it with the attitude that was already sullied. I was so upset. Isn't this weird that I was upset about video games? But I was. The Wii, pointing, <laughs> pointing at the TV and shooting. I freaking love that. It's one of the things I loved about the Wii. You designed uh, Trauma Center Second Opinion, so you know pointing feels awesome. You're doing things. feels like you and the TV are connection really happening right there. So great. Then Capcom just forgot to make uh, a real Resident Evil game where I got to point and shoot again uh, on the Wii. They just made some pretty good uh, on-rail shooters, and they made uh, a port of Dead Rising that played like Resident Evil 4, but nobody had any respect for it because the graphics were terrible, and it they wanted it to be like Re Dead Rising on the 360, and it wasn't. So then I heard Silent Hill's coming. Yes! They're going to let me point and shoot at the thing. No. No pointing and shooting. I'm super sad. Well, you could... There's a flash... Why do you hate flashlights? What's your What's your problem? <laughs> do you like the dark that much? Interesting. The Wii is so interesting to me because it became the flashlights console. <laughs> Way Forward did it with Lit... Uh, Fragile Dreams did it. Uh, the, the Silent Hill did it. I know there's at least one other good flashlight game. And you're right, that was super fun. But it, for me, Silent Hill Shattered Memories, and I think for a lot of Wii owners who had this chip on our shoulders where we're constantly telling people, there's really good games on the Wii, you should play them. And they say, uh, do they have online multiplayer? Do they have action? Are they on-rail shooters? And you keep asking and say, oh, there's no online. There's no action in this particular one. Or, and then I wanted to scream at them all and tell them to play Shattered Memories. And they're like, do you get shoot, guys? You, you shooting? I said, no shooting. And they said, no buying. And it was super sad. But you took that risk anyway. Tell me about the thinking you went into with Shattered Memories when you said, this is going to be a game where there's no real combat. You're constantly on the defense. Well, so, as I said, uh, my first month at Konami, I pitched the Silent Hill on Wii, which had a flashlight. That was They, they didn't have flashlights yet. It hadn't become... It had just come out. Right. This was when you first started at Konami. Yeah, so... The so started yet. It, that kind of died and disappeared and went in the background. And so we were working on Origins and Homecoming, and I was sort of crunching on Contra 4. And then somehow in management, they decided that Climax should make another one, maybe on the Wii. Um, and the, the producer on it at the time sort of took that behind an invisible wall that I couldn't see behind. So I didn't know what was going on. And then he left the company... And they said, who's going to handle this Wii Silent Hill? It's just kind of floating there. Climax has contacted us and said, what's going on? So they handed me the, the GDD, the design doc. And I was, I was like, okay, flashlight, okay. I'm glad they kept that because the Wii needs more flashlights. Uh, going through, and then I read like the story. Uh, so I read No Combat, and I was like, okay, this is interesting. Because people, th you know, Homecoming's... Uh, if you were going to hate it before you played it, it was like, Homecoming's about shooting. Mm -hmm. That's not Silent Hill, that's dumb. So I thought, mm -hmm. no combat, that's interesting. Let's mm -hmm. keep reading. And then it, it had the story in there and how the story played out and the twist at the end. And I went, this is ridiculous, I have to work on this game. So I ran into the head of production's office and again, 
I guess this is my secret to success. I went, I have to produce this game. Make me the producer. This is amazing. And so they went, oh, okay, whatever. And so that's how I became the producer on, on Shattered Memories. So a lot of the great ideas were totally climax uh, in design. The story was all Sam Barlow. Um, mm. But I loved it, so I made it my own and protected it. So when people came in and said, a lot of people want shooting. Can we put in some shooting? I was like, no, we're not putting in shooting. We're not doing that. This is not about that. Sorry, Jonathan. Oh, that's okay. And, and because now I have more shooting games than I can... I have more shooting games than I want. <laughs> and now I can go back and play Shattered Memories and be like, there's nothing else like this, period, that I can think of. Uh, was that what your thinking was at the time? Was like, we're going to kind of defy convention and be damned how well it sells? Or were you thinking this might sell better because the Wii is popular with such a broad audience that a lot of people don't like shooting who bought the Wii, potentially. So maybe this will be kind of the first Silent Hill for people who never played the past games and never wanted to play an action game but have the maturity for a psychological horror experience. Uh, what, yeah, what were, you, what were you hoping would play it? How well were you thinking it might do? It's kind of what you were saying earlier that Silent Hill, I mean, I agree with you. It's, it's always about like surprising the player, making them go like, oh, wow, I didn't expect that, or this is different than what it seemed. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's my whole time on the series that was a challenge because uh, 2 and 3 really explained how the universe worked. So once you played those, if you understood it, it was kind of like, well, what, how are we going to surprise you? Mm -hmm. And so I fell in love with, with uh, the concept of Shattered Memories because everything about it was different. The story was like, oh, it's Silent Hill 1, huh? And then it was totally different. And then the gameplay was totally different. And it was really... I love point-and-click adventures. And it was basically a point-and-click adventure evolved for the Wii. And that was really exciting. And just and then the fact it was on the Wii and Nintendo players hadn't really played Silent Hill if they were like super ardent Nintendo-only people. Mm -hmm. So it was like we're going to give you something you've never seen before. And then any Silent Hill fans who play it, it's not really what they've seen before either. And I just loved that concept. So, you know, maybe we should have put in shooting. Maybe it would have sold more. Ah, how did it's it, a more did it pure, sell? Uh, not great. <laughs> I don't even know how it sold. Did it sell not super great. worse than... If you remember... Uh, you don't have to give me numbers, of course, and I don't know if you, you have them or if I'd even want them, but was it kind of up and down in terms of how you felt uh, in terms of uh, success, business success after each game? Or was it continually the same kind of experience? Uh, like, which ones did you feel best about after you'd finished them? The, the more I liked a Silent Hill game, the less well it sold, it seems. That is awful. So, uh, Homecoming, Ish. we've talked about, you were like, yeah, you know, people had some points for for not liking it as much. That one sold pretty well. Yeah, sold decent. Yeah, and then yeah. Shattered Memories came after that. Is that right? Yeah. And then that one you liked. Not great. I loved it. Not, not great. <laughs> and then uh, Downpour after that. Down, uh, Downpour I liked, and I think it sold okay. That's Downpour, right. I think Downpour made me a liar right there. Oh, good. So yeah. Well, that, but Downpour is the one you said. You felt combined all of the the components yeah. of Sound Hill and balanced them in the the best way. Yep. And what did you think of Deadly Premonition? Um. So I know that people love it, and I'm sure it has its merits. Mm. But my friend got it for me as a gag gift, and he before he gave it to me, he said, "Hey, look at this trailer for this game. It's really cool." And it was like. They were having tea or coffee or something. Probably coffee, because FK is in the coffee, right? That's right. Uh, that's right, Zach. Uh, and I noticed that the song in the background was a Super Mario World song that they kind of ripped off a little bit. And so somehow, song? yeah, yeah. I never thought of it that way. Yeah. Once it once you hear it, you can't unhear it. I can't unhear it anymore. And so 
I was like, that's terrible. Why would they? Ah, oh, who? No. And then he was like, happy birthday. And so I played it, and it was in a group setting, and that's not how you want to play that game anyway. Hmm. So I just had a bad experience. And I, I own it. I, I will go back to it one day. But then they announced the director's cut. Mm -hmm. Now it's like, do I want to play it or play the director's cut? Why they got to do that, man? Why do companies have to re-release classic games? They do it a lot. They do. I've noticed. It's a profit deal, I think. <laughs> People end up buying the same game a few times and they make more money. Uh, so you left Konami last year? Yes. At the, right. Well, at the beginning of this year, technically. And was that... Yeah, this is always dicey. I can't help but be very curious about why you left, what conditions you left, uh, and if you already had the way forward job in mind, or whether you were kind of putting yourself out in limbo for a while. So talk about that as much as you want. I won't be pressuring you, but uh, anything well, you want to tell us would be interesting. Uh, much as... When I left Atlas, I kind of wanted to make be more involved in the game making process, mm -hmm. and so Konami was cool because the producers had a lot of creative control compared to other companies. Um, but a lot of my developers, including Adam at WayForward, were like, "You're not really a producer type guy. Mm. You're really more of a director type guy." And I said, "I know, right?" And then. Uh, <laughs> And then one day, Way Forward was like, "Hey, there's a director spot open." And I love Way Forward; they're great. I love their games. I'm a big fan. Yeah, you worked with them on Contra Four and Book, Book of Memories. Memories. Anything else? I've tried to work with them on a lot of things, but you know, different projects fall through and stuff doesn't happen. But I, I liked I them enough to keep how trying. What did they do with the Castlevania? Did that ever come up while you were at Konami? No, that was that was all owned by Japan. But uh, I know they would make a good Castlevania. Absolutely. So Konami, if you're listening, way forward would make a good Castlevania. Because they haven't made a... The last one was Rebirth uh, Adventure, I think, on WiiWare, which I quite liked, but it's been a while since there's been a nice sprite-based 2D Castlevania. It'd be a good thing. Yeah. yeah. So you already knew way forward... Sounds like they kind of headhunted you out of Konami. So Not really. It, I mean, I was kind of looking to become more of a design role because mm -hmm. I thought if people are going to blame me for all these decisions, I might as well be the one making the decisions. Mm -hmm. um, and you wanted to be making those decisions. And I wanted to be making the decisions. So yeah. it, it was just kind of like the right time for both, both groups, I guess. Mm -hmm. So it was... It's amicable for everybody involved, I guess. See, it doesn't surprise me. Is your what's your middle name? My middle name? Mm hmm Cole? I thought it was gonna be amicable. <laughs> you've just been so amicable with every from Virgin to uh, Atlas to everybody, hey guys, you're just getting along with everyone so well and it's working for you. It's something that I wish because people talk to me on the internet quite a bit. Sometimes they say you son of a bitch, how do I get a job like yours? You are terrible. Why don't you hire me? And I say, well, for starters, n no one wants to work with people they're going to not like or people that are going to be mean to them, potentially. So unless you start being nice to people on the internet, uh, Sex Panther 55 you know, I don't even know their <laughs> real name. They're just going by anonymous. Like, oh, hire me. Have me on your podcast. Uh, but you've shown that people skills can get you working at some amazing companies, doing some awesome things for a lot of your life. Yeah, the, and also being good at it, of course. I, I hope so. Uh, <laughs> the best... I, I mean, I just like games a lot, obviously, because I started yeah. testing them and then bought more. Um, but it's, it's nice to be working with people who you could just talk about games with. Mm -hmm. So it's just like fourth grade, where you'd go, I just got the new Nintendo Power, did you see this thing? And they're like, oh man, I played Willow last night. And you're like, Willow, what's that about? And you just start talking. And so there's a lot of people in the industry that are like that. And so mm. I guess I just find them, and then we just geek out together. And now I get to do it. At Way Forward is full of those people. So I've now it's that. like, I really have to talk about Battle of, Battle of Olympus with somebody. 
hey you, have you played Battle of Olympus? And then we just t- start talking about Battle of Olympus. You know who has been talking to me about Battle of Olympus is Tyrone Rodriguez of Nicholas. I don't hmm. know if you know Tyrone. I, I worked he, with his brother, actually. Oh, um, oh, I'm forgetting his name. Victor. That's it, Victor. He's uh, the, also Nicholas. Um, Tyrone all of a sudden just emailed me and was like, hey, I'm in Japan right now having lunch with my friend who made Battle of Olympus. I'm like, what? He's like, yeah, I just made it. He made that once. Did you play that? And I vaguely remembered it, and then I looked it up. I was like, that game was amazing. This is the world we live in now. We are of the age <laughs> where we just know the guys who made the games that we loved growing up, and we get to make games with them and just talk to people that get this culture on a, on a day-to-day basis. It's pretty incredible. That's crazy. Yeah, I'm really happy at, you're doing this thing. At Konami, yeah. I met a guy who worked on Castlevania 64, which I kind of enjoyed myself, actually. Yeah, I was going to say. Was that, so, like, tense a little bit, though? I was like, hey, that I just heard that you worked on Castlevania 64. That's And he went, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, no, no, it's cool. I dig it. I'm really glad you worked on that game. It could have been much worse. It could have been uh, much worse. I had a real Capgrass. Um, yeah, Nintendo 64 is my Capgrass in the uh, system. <laughs> like, uh, Mario 64, I was like, this doesn't feel like Mario. I hate it. Ocarina of Time. Oh, it doesn't feel... Look at those polygons. Why am I walking for so long in a straight line? This isn't Zelda. I hate it. There's so many N64 games. But out of all of them, I would say Castlevania 64, now that I think about it, I at least felt like it had heart. I felt it like it had a humility, and they did their best with what they had. And I like the werewolf one, all right? Yeah, the werewolf, werewolf one was a good upgrade. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. It's kind of a bloody roar side to it. Uh, I do want to... We have some questions coming in, but before we get to them, is there anything you can tell me about what you're doing at WayForward? You haven't been there for too long, but everyone I know at WayForward, uh, Austin Ivan Smith and Adam Tierney, bug me on Twitter a lot and occasionally send me emails saying, dude, we're working on something so good. <laughs> See ya. And I'm like, what? But, 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 what is... And then I ask them, is it Mega Man? And then they're like, I've never even heard of that series, man. What's wrong with you? And then they just uh, sign off. I don't hear from them for a week. So I have the feeling Way Forward is working on something really good right now. And then you joined Way Forward pretty recently. I can't help but put two and two together. Are you working on something kind of good right now? Um... I'm working on something pretty amazing. Not kind of good, pretty amazing. Really? And there I mean there's a lot it's a good year for way forward. There's a lot of exciting things. I mean you know about DuckTales, which is like DuckTales, right? I'm not yeah. on it, but I, you know, I'm glad I'm working at the company that's making it. Mm-hmm. Um and there's the Shantae that was in Nintendo Power. Um Shantae 3, I guess technically. Switch Force to mm-hmm. uh, my project, um, uh, Cat Girl, uh, a lot of stuff is in the works. So I mean, I can't really tell you what mine is, but it's exciting. They're all exciting. Did you just say Cat Girl too? What? You know about the Cat Girl feeling? Well, we announced actually. it a couple weeks ago. Yeah, you did. Yeah. And there was uh, a flurry of activity around it. I was called a, a dumb man for being excited about it and writing about it like it was a real game. People were like, duh, Holmes, it's April 1st, game isn't real. And I said, I'm going to make it real, frankly. I'm going to post like it's a real game. And for people listening to the show who don't know, it is a rhythm game, shoot 'em up action, a visual novel, RPG um, I can't remember what the last... There's got plenty of genres in there. It's coming to every console, and it's got beautiful graphics about a flying cat girl who hangs around with robotic squids, and they shoot uh, Madam Cat in the face while dancing, I think. <laughs> so that's <laughs> going to happen, right? It's pretty... I mean, it's pretty top secret. I shouldn't be talking about it. Um, but it has concept art. I mean, real games have concept art, so... True. Every point, is, point is, my game... Top uh-huh. secret. I can tell you what it's not. Please do. It is not Battle of Olympus. Okay. <laughs> it is not Guardian Legend. It is not Clue Clue Land. Is it Faxing? Or Clue Clue Land 2. 
Clue Land D? It's Clue Clue Land E, isn't it? You're going back to the disc system. Clue Clue Land E. Uh, it's the next level of Clue. Uh, you could you give me any legit hints, though? Is it a... Could you... And just say no if you can't tell me, of course. But is it a original way forward game or a licensed game? Can you tell me that, maybe? Well, this is shocking uh-huh. to fans of way forward. Uh-huh. From time to time, they make really good licensed games. They do. So it may be a licensed game. Whoa. But okay. I've said too much. I've said too much. You've, you haven't. You, but I don't know. It's yeah. not Adventures of Lolo either. But Adventures of Lolo is fun. It has really good gameplay, and it has mind-bending puzzles. And I'm contractually obligated to mention it on this podcast. <laughs> I recently found out that the person who did the Mega Man 2 music, I think she did, no, Mega Man 1 music, she did a Lech Man and Guts Man, I think, and did the da 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 she did the music for Adventure of Lolo on the Game Boy, which is not that bad. No way. You should check it out. Did that and have she... one track like the NES version? I Just think it has two track. tracks. Ooh. It's got one track until the last level. Then there's like a scary track. Next cause... gen. <laughs> but now the question's happened, and I'm Uh-oh. being a jerk just talking about Adventures of Lolo. That is a pretty good game, though. Lolo. Uh, R. Xanadu asks, if you were starting in college today, would you still have made Excalibur the way you did back in the day? Or would you have done things differently? Excellent question. Things have changed so much. If you were 10 years different in age, if you were making uh, Excalibur now with stre- uh, Steam Greenlight and Kickstarter and all that, well, how do you think things would have been different? I would have kickstarted it. <laughs> <laughs> so if I had 4,000 signatures... And each people and each person people each person gave me ten dollars. Mm-hmm. I would still not have enough to make a game, but I would have a lot more than I had at the time. And maybe that would have we would have had some money, so maybe it would have encouraged us to just finish it ourselves. We wouldn't have needed a publisher, so that would have been a big obstacle gone. It just would have been: can we deliver a game in this amount of time? And we sort of went through different periods of staffing where we had really good people or not as good people. So depending on where in the timeline that happened, we probably could have finished it and released it. It wouldn't have been on Game Boy, obviously, or a portable. It would have been on Steam or or maybe maybe it would have gone Shovel Knight and been on everything now. Maybe it would yeah. have got tons of money. That uh, uh, Speaking of that, I didn't ask. Uh, did you lose money when you started your own company? Way back then. Um, yes, we oh, uh, we we sort of took me and me and my friend who started the company, sort of took our savings, um, some of mine from my um, old days in the industry as a kid, and we we pooled it and we gave it to a staff member who had a key job, and he kind of did just enough to get a demo that he could get a job at a different company. Aww. And then we didn't have any money anymore, which kind of sucked. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> did that make you feel like I shouldn't do this? I give up? Or did that make you think I can't Ma- stop now? I can't have it, that be my last It made me feel money. like, oh man, now I don't have money to pay anybody. But I, <laughs> but stopping really didn't occur to me. Yeah. Have you ever considered working in other fields? I mean, it could be easier to just make a reality show or uh, I don't know. <laughs> The, the, any number of jobs that don't involve this level, this amount of people, this amount of financial risk, this amount of pressure, this amount of fan scrutiny. Video games isn't that easy, but you've stuck with it. Uh, why do you think? Yeah, I mean, ever since I played Mega Man Two back in the day, mm. I thought, you know, I could do this. Is this seems fun? And like people make these games, and sometimes people make these really good games. So I want to be one of those people, and so. All through elementary school, I'd be like writing on pieces of paper on the playground, just sitting on the ground and drawing River City Ransom characters, or my hit, uh, my hit original character Mecha Man. He was a big one. Um, he's a robot who fights evil. He's green, and he fights Doctor Willy. No so 
I was anyway. <laughs> Two L's. Yeah. So, <laughs> ever since that, I thought this is the life for me. And then a couple weeks ago, I had this moment where, you know, I'm a director at Way Forward now, and I was watching TV, drawing on a piece of paper, not Mecha Man, but like a real thing for my game, and mm -hmm. sort of balancing the game with a ballpoint pen on paper, and I thought, this is exactly what I always thought making games was like. And now, I'm making a real game this way. So, I'm super happy to be at Way Forward, and that was kind of an amazing, hey wait, this is real, this is fourth grade all over again. That's so good. And we're, from what I know, there weren't people like us 50 years ago who grew up, we talked about uh, this a little bit before, but you grew up with video games, and you grew up with an idea of how to make them, but you couldn't go to school for it. You know, there wasn't anyone who told you this is the way it's done. You still draw on a paper and a, with a ballpoint pen, and that and you that's your method that you came up with in fourth grade, and it seems to be working. You are doing it the way that you wanted to based on your inspirations growing up. That's yeah, Kids today have it easy, man. Back in my day, we made video games with rocks, and that was good enough. <laughs> There was someone who was on the show not that long ago. I think it was James Kachelka. He's a he's a comic book artist, but he loves video games. He's um, he feels as though they're underutilized for the various different things they can express, particularly kind of uh, lo-fi graphics. And he makes games with his kids where you have to drive. It's a he treats it like a video game, but it's with a pen and piece of paper. You have to drive a car by flicking your wrist and not going outside of the, the track that they pre-drew. And they'll do that for hours. And they consider wow. that like a legit game. Uh, and then in his off time, he makes real games with uh, Pixel Jam, real video games. They're making Glorkbot's Mini Adventure. Something you should look into. It's pretty fun. Anyway, I'm ignoring the questions like a dink. Sorry. CJ Melendez asked... Hi, CJ. Hi, buddy. Oh, you know Shout out to CJ. Okay. Yeah. He, he's uh, frequently on the show. Uh, CJ Melendez asks, Now that you're working with WayForward, the developer of Silent Hill Book of Memories, if Konami wants to do a sequel with WayForward, who, or maybe means what, what sort of things would you guys do with it? Yeah, is that a... Uh, because you might work with Konami now on the other end of things from, from WayForward, so is that going to change the dynamic, and are there new things you feel like you could do uh, on this new end of it. Hmm. Well, I think a lot of the connections. He puts right in brackets here. Persona across Silent Hill, please. Just do that. <laughs> Just call the guys. Well, Book of Memories had a lot of Persona vibe to it. Um. To the point where after I played it, uh, and then I played Persona Four Golden again. I was like, ooh, there's a lot of Persona in Book of Memories. That's a lot more than I thought. Um, I would probably hope it would be a traditional Silent Hill. Because WayForward didn't get to do, like, traditional Silent Hill. They they got to be the ones that made the different one. Mm -hmm. So I'd like to do a traditional one. But I don't... It's hard. I'd say, like, well, I'm at WayForward now. I don't have to worry about that. But I'm pretty sure if they got approached to do a Silent Hill, they'd stick me on it. So I guess I do have to worry about it. <laughs> now I'll stay up and I'd, I would want to do something really in interesting like Shattered Memories where there's like a... It's not just a guy that you're walking behind and he's opening doors and things. It would be like mm -hmm. there'd be something else to it, but it would be following one person through the town with mm -hmm. a mystery. Did I you ever know. play uh, Lone Survivor? I did. What did you think of that? I really liked it. Um, I thought uh, the art style was amazing. Mm. But I actually thought he... And I can say this because I blogged about it, so I'll back mm -hmm. up what I said. Um, Where did you blog about it? On my blog. Oh, I'm going to post it on your blog. www.tomhewlett.com I will check that out. Uh, I, he, there was a lot of nods to Silent Hill that he did. Like a lot of the menu sounds and the things were really direct homages. Mm -hmm. But I thought that was actually the weakest part of the game. I thought his original ideas were so good that I wished he had just like, just gone from like this is like 2D Silent Hill and that's it, and then he just did his own thing. Mm -hmm. So hopefully his next game, if it's anything similar, will sort of do that. 
I just, I thought his original ideas were really great, so I wanted to see more of those. I'll tell him you said so. He's a past guest of the show. His name is Jasper Byrne, and he's going to be on, I think, relatively soon. He's got a new, like, sort of upbeat four-player combat game that takes from, like, Monster Hunter, and <laughs> it's really, yeah, he's just like, forget it. I just want to make a game for about friends being together and teaming cool. up on a thing. And uh, he's really excited about it. He almost scrapped it because he's not. You should meet him someday. He needs a guy like you to be like, let's just do some ideas. Because uh, I don't know Jasper particularly well, but as I know him, he's like, oh, I have this idea, but I'm worried it sucks. I'm kind of worried I suck. Maybe, maybe I'll just not do it. And then he finally does it, and everyone freaks out because, like yeah. you said, his original ideas are so great. I want to play. Uh, Get him over the way forward, man. We'll make so many games. <laughs> That's the other thing. He's like in England and he's like, I don't want to move and I don't really want anyone to buy my games because it feels weird. So I'll just make them for free. Like uh, Lone Survivor was his first game he made for money. Before that, he just gave them away. Uh, yeah, I know. That we want to pay you. We want to give you our money. Let us give you our money. <laughs> That's what I said to him. Uh, and before I forget, there are more questions, and I will get to them. Crap, we only have 14 minutes left. This has gone very quickly. Uh, we should clear up exactly what you did on the Silent Hill HD collection, the much Uh-oh. maligned HD collection. We talked a tiny bit, like one minute before the show started, and you cleared that up for me because I've heard people get very angry at you about the HD collection being not that good. But did you even make that thing? What did you do on it? So I'll keep this brief because we got to get to those questions. Sure. And because I'm tired of talking about it. Um, sure. Uh, so HD collection, they were going to take two and three and make them HD, and that's a cool idea. And then they said, we're going to change the voices. And I said, if you change the voices, I want to be in charge of that because I want to make them really good and make sure they live up to sort of the legacy of Silent Hill 2 and 3. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so they said, okay, you're in charge of the voice recording. So I did, I put the scripts together and I worked with a guy from Hijinks and we got all the timing written out and all the lines so it would be perfect. And I chose Mary Elizabeth McGlynn to be the director and we recorded the new voices and I was done. So that was my official responsibility. So if you hate the new voices, not that they're there. If you hate them, the voices, that's all me. Just dump it on me. Send me all the Facebook death threats you want. But if you have a problem with the other stuff, that's not just me. I didn't say, ruin this game so my games look better because I'm evil Yeah. and I'm a mastermind of destruction. That's maybe... <laughs> Isn't it interesting? And this just sounds so mocking. I do not mean to sound condescending and mocking, but it is interesting that people think that uh, someone thought, yeah, we'll just make it bad. We'll just make a bad game. That's fine. We let's, don't care about Let's our burn a bunch of money. Let's just... <laughs> yeah, no, I don't think that happens, frankly. And I don't think that you guys... Uh, just like surf uh, the internet and watch cat videos when you should be working on your game and then just ship it and be like, oh, well, uh, because you don't want to die. I mean, you want to eat food, and you can't do that unless you work, and you can't work unless people think you make a good product. So that's uh, – stop me if I'm uh, wrong on any of that, but that was my take on it. Yeah, the Sonic I mean, it... HD collection was not due to lack of uh, caring. It, it's understandable because, like, again, hundreds of people make games, and you can't see a hundred people and be like, "I'm mad at you for what you did." Mm-hmm. You just see the guy that's out in front. And since I was the guy who knew the lore, I was the guy out in front speaking on behalf of the series. So of course they target me. But I've been like accredited for marketing. Did this? It's Tom Hewlett's fault. Or this person, this voice actor said this, and I didn't like it. And Tommy Hewlett probably vetted that comment that was made at a con because he's the licensing. I don't know. I'm, I'm just credited with all these different jobs, management, development. Like, I don't have that much money, you guys. I'm not doing all those jobs. There's a pile of clutter just off camera because I live in a small apartment. If I was responsible for all that stuff, I'd have like a 
a butler to take care of that for me. Yeah, you'd be off Kojimaing it up. Right. Off at parties and <laughs> wrapping yourself in a in a mummy mask and having fun. And on the camera. <laughs> you're you're stuck in a the, it's in a very nice apartment. I see that by on a commando lunchbox. Oh, thank you. Very very envious. Um. So you did the directing of the voices and the the writing to make it match with the old, but it doesn't sound like it was your idea to do new voices. Uh, it's, was it, it was a bunch of factors. It wasn't. I, it wasn't the factor people think it was, but it's all like political stuff, so I can't. Sure. Other factors. Wade into uh, that water. Was there any uh, any thought to ever include more SD? Silent Hill games, like maybe Shattered Memories on there? I, I would have been more likely to buy it if Shattered Memories was there with move support or something all along those It would lines. have been cool. when I mean, when it was started, the sort of... I mean, I know right now it's like everyone did HD collections, and they, for every major series I've got my HD collection, but back then it was like God of War had happened and that was it. So mm-hmm. it was like, how do we want to do this? What's the best way? And it was just decided to be two and three. And then once you decide something like that, it's not easy to change it so sure yeah no just wondering yeah one probably wouldn't have worked out quite right but anyway the questions we have nine minutes left i am such a dink uh chimiro asks what was your best experience working at konami that's a nice cheery question thank you chimiro um my best experience working at konami i don't know that's hard um uh contra for rocket knight and uh, shattered memories, because I'm I'm proud of how they turned out and the teams were great. We didn't talk much about Rocket Knight. I feel badly about that. Rocket Knight is that's Sparkster, right? Yep, it was on uh, XBLA and PSN and Steam, and it was a revival of I miss. It was a revival of the classic games uh, Rocket Knight and Sparkster, which are super great. Mm-hmm. And I actually got a compliment from. Nakazato, the producer of the original games, who also did a bunch of the Contra games, and he said he felt my games accomplished uh, sort of the spirit of that they wanted to accomplish back in the day. So that was a big, you know, I printed out that email and I have it. <laughs> and he didn't have to write that. It's not like you were no. at a dinner party and you were like, what do you think of my game? And he was like, it, uh... accomplished the spirit of what we <laughs> he sought you out and was like, I wanted this guy to know you did yeah. a good job. So that, well, that's I mean, awesome. that was really cool. That was really special. And I guess, and from coworkers who were in Japan when it came out, like Konami Japan, a bunch of people were just like playing it all the time, and probably should have been working, but I'll yeah, forgive that's them. That's pretty awesome. And and what was your role on that game? I was the producer, and I pitched it. I pitched it, got it signed, produced it, and yeah. It was cool. I, I was curious about the uh, the graphics because a lot of people assumed you would go kind of a Mega Man Nine direction with it or a Contra Four direction with it, but you went the polygon based route. Was that your decision? And if so, uh, what made you go that direction? Um, it was sort of a group decision, just based on you know you have a set budget, you have a set time, and it's like okay, this approach will take this long and cost this much. This approach will take this long and cost this much, and uh, as cool as it would be to have like fluid like 60 frames a second hand drawn animation all that stuff um, the gameplay is really important and I didn't want it to just be a pretty game that played like crap or a pretty game that was really short mm-hmm. so gameplay first everybody and then then it was just oh we're going to do polygons let's make them look really sweet and I think they had a lot of character to them oh, um, sure. and that, I mean, that's another important thing with Rocket Knight is will the character come across and will it have that sense of fun? And it did, so. And I'm right in taking from that that uh, 60 frames uh, hand-drawn, kind of like the... Uh, I'm blanking on the name of it all of a sudden. It wasn't Contra. It wasn't technically Contra, but it was clearly a Contra game by Arc Systems Works. Oh, Hardcore Uprising. Yeah, Hardcore Uprising. Um, to make it look like Hardcore Uprising would have cost more money than... The, the polygon look you went for? Yeah, uh, Hardcore Uprising, I think, started about the same time-ish, mm-hmm. maybe even before, mm-hmm. and it came out much after Rocket Knight, so that sort yeah, of gives you an idea. After, right? Yeah, 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 that makes sense. That's a neat game, too, though. Yes. Uh, all right, I'm being a jerk again. We have six minutes and tons of questions. And Frank Blanco 
you might as well change your name because I'm never going to say your name aloud on this show. I'm going to call you Anne Frank Blanco and uh, deal with it. Anne Frank Blanco says, do you think publishers tend to push their most popular series past their prime just to cash in on popularity? Also, sorry there are so many awful Silent Hill fans. Oh, I see you, Anne Frank Blanco. Uh, so yeah, do you feel, uh, having been at a big publisher, um, I assume this would have potentially happened more at Konami than at Atlas, do you feel as though these uh, series can get run ragged uh, because they, they are a source of income so the company can do other stuff with the, with the money from that series? I think... I think... I don't know, because at the same time, the company is, you know, like cranking out whatever game it is. Mm -hmm. um, the fans kind of want that, or it wouldn't give them the money that they get. Mm -hmm. Like, if it was just like, you just want the cash, this is, there's no reason for this, no one wants this, then they wouldn't get the cash for it, mm. and it wouldn't mm -hmm. serve its purpose. But again, it, it's not really a Konami problem, because Metal Gear games get, you know, three years between them. I mean, sometimes two of them come out at the same time, but that's because one's on portable and one's on console. Like Silent Hill games have a couple years between them. Mm -hmm. It's you know, it's not it's like certain companies are just like every year you can count on it. Here's the new installment of whatever. Oh sure, uh, Assassin's Konami. Creed. Yeah, yeah. Konami gave them some time and made sure they weren't just pushing out because you know it's it's that time again. It's Silent Hill time. There we go. But at the same token, it doesn't sound like, like if you had gone to Silent Hill, I mean, gone to Konami and said, well, Shattered Memories is going to be the last Silent Hill game, guys. I think we've done everything we can do here. Um, time to quit. Yeah, they probably wouldn't have gone for it, I assume. They would have said, no, we got to keep this going because, uh, you know, it, it works for the company. Um, uh, do you, or, or do you think I'm wrong? Do you think it's possible that any of these series no, I mean, I think ever finally get retired? To some extent. Like like Kojima, every, after every major Metal Gear, he's like, "That's the last one," and then one mm -hmm. E3 later, it's like, "Here's the new Metal Gear." So maybe, but I would never say I would never have said that about Silent Hill because I'd be worried they would listen to me, and then I wouldn't get to work on another Silent Hill game, and that wouldn't have been cool. They would have right. put me back on Wings Club. So. <laughs> so what I'm what I'm gathering is. Uh... People really want to keep making these games, and as long as there's people that want to keep making them, hopefully they'll get to continue. Um, a lot of people are worried Mega Man is, is over with now, even though Capcom, they did put out uh, Street Fighter cross Mega Man, and they've said they're going to make a new Mega Man game. People have just had the feeling that that series has died. Other people have said maybe it should be dead. Yet I was going to say, say mm -hmm. that's a good example, because Mega Man they used to crank out every year. Yep. And people were like, and it was like sort of like, oh, well, is it going to be like Mega Man where there's a new one every year? Or are you going to wait between the game? Now Capcom's waiting, and everyone's like, where's our Mega Man? We want Mega Man. <laughs> it's impossible to win. I know. <laughs> uh, Downstairs Kitchen asks, would like to let Tom know I hold Shattered Memories very close to my heart. It was very comforting to me during a turbulent period of my life. I'm grateful for the work he contributed to it. May I ask, oh my god, Downstairs Kitchen is the most polite human being on the internet. You are, Jesus, I love you, Downstairs Kitchen. May I ask your experience working with Climax on the game, particularly Sam Barlow. What creative input can a producer expect to have on a game of this nature? So yes, tell us about working with Sam Barlow specifically and so, uh, how that whole process it was. It was super great working with uh, Climax. They were really professional and um, sort of like I said, I'd seen the, the design doc and gotten excited about it. And then a couple months later, I was flying out there to see their vertical slice build of the game. And they made sure it showed all the, you know, all the great elements of the game. It was really polished. Um, it was really great. And then working with Sam, uh, he was really in love with his script. And like I said, I was, I loved the concept and all the stuff. And I'd worked in localization, so writers are always kind of like, I want to write my words because I'm a writer. Um, but I didn't really have to do that much. Most most of really what I did uh, with Sam is he's he's British. But we won't hold that against him. Uh, that's terrible, you guys. That's, that's right. Britain's awesome. great. Uh, 
but uh, so it was really just like, hey, this doesn't sound right in America, and Silent Hill takes place in America. So, and then he'd say, oh, you've never heard that expression? Everyone here says it, and I'd say, no, it's no Sam. Hmm. Um, but no, he'd come out for voice recording, and I mean, I j when I went to England on vacation uh, in December. I, I w made sure to swing by Climax and have drinks with Sam, so that should tell you how easy it was to work with Sam. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. What, do you know what he's working on now? Um, you don't have to tell me. I don't know. I hope he's working on something. I don't know. Something good, I hope. Yeah, me too. Me too. The more I'm thinking about it, the more I'm getting resentful that uh, Silent Hill Shattered Memories wasn't more popular. I hope people give it a shot. There, There's so much talk right now in the wake of Bioshock Infinite, I think, uh, is a big part of it, where games that are supposed to have psychological depth and meaning and feelings and more than just, um, you know, a power fantasy, everyone's talking about how great it is that they're hitting the forefront. But those kinds of games have been sitting around in the background for a while, and they were often passed up on because they weren't marketable or people couldn't figure out what it was about uh, on a or it wasn't cool, or I don't know. Uh, I hope people dig back, uh, dig back into their backlog at this point after enjoying games like Bioshock Infinite and check out Shattered Hill, Shattered Memories. Do you think that's Shattered Hill? Sorry. Does that make any sort of sense? I'm getting nervous. Cause I, I, I agree. People... I felt that way after I played Walking Dead, and Walking Dead became like the big thing. Uh -huh. And they're like, it's so great, it's not about fighting, and it's about conversation, and the game changes as you play. Like, that sounds familiar. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I've heard that was, before. And I wonder how would Shattered Memories have done if it were an episodic game tied to a, a hugely popular TV show at the at the time and on on different consoles. Who knows? It could have done just as well as Walking Dead. Hopefully hopefully game. Konami ports it to Wii U or something and then then we could find out. Yeah, I would love that. That would make me feel great. Arzanadu asks, do you think a good co-op uh, horror game could be created? My vision, he's got an idea. Yeah, I think he thinks one could be created. My vision for this would be at least make the players go off into completely different areas to complete different objectives in parallel. In that way, you could create different scenarios for each character. So kind of sharing the experience at the same time, but uh, being off on your own and, and have to deal with the fear of being alone at the same time. Huh, it's kind of an interesting idea. You ever thought about trying to make a co-op survival horror game? Actually, yeah, uh, Downpour was originally going to be co-op with really? uh, Mur Murphy and Anne being player one and two. But, huh. and we did have ideas that I won't say in case Konami wants to use them, <laughs> but we did have some ideas, but we realized those ideas were kind of beyond the scope that we could accomplish in the time we had. Um, so rather than try to do it and fail and make this mess of a co-op survival horror game, we just cut the, the co-op and made a single player. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Yeah, I hope they keep going with it. That, that would be yet a, another new Silent Hill idea to enjoy. Uh, CJ Melendez, it was probably our final question because we're a little over time, but we started a little late, so hopefully Sinistar isn't too angry. TJ Melendez asks, if you could change anything about Downpour, what would it be? Um, it wouldn't be so buggy. Mm. Because I think a lot of the stuff we did is really great, and a lot of people aren't seeing it because they either found it was buggy or they heard it was buggy and didn't buy it. So mm -hmm. I wish more people had played it and given it a shot and looked past all that. Hopefully they still will. I imagine a future where every video game is just around everyone all the time. They can just download Downpour on their phone. And, oh, I heard this good. Or you know, it's just uh, it's in the cloud. It's buzzing in. Or we'll have internet in our skulls, and we can just play it in there. Hopefully, all of these games uh, that maybe didn't find their audience at the time will have a resurgence later on. I don't know if you played Earthbound. That game freaking tanks when it first came out. I you got a Mr. It. Saturn back there. I don't know if you can see him. Yeah, I see but... him. Yeah, under the slime. That game didn't do so hot at the time, and then thanks to internet and uh, community-based enjoyment of that game and sharing it, it's become a, a path uh, pathway for other people to get to know each other. They join a, 
earthbound community and they have a shared language and jokes and it's become a huge thing now much bigger than it was before anyway and it just took 20 years or so to do it but they did it so, and now we can uh, play like it on Wii U yeah I know I know I've been talking about that and people have been getting angry <laughs> at me about what I think but anyway Tom thank you so much for being on the show they thank should you. read your TomHewlett.com where else can they keep track of what you're doing that's about it. I You're at the Way Forwards. I am so at the Way Forwards. There. Yes. Yeah. You're on the Twitter? No. You I'm could get on, on there. there. I could get on if, the Twitter. If you get on Twitter, can we come up with your Twitter name right now? Or what should my Twitter name be? What should we do? Uh Hugh uh, Hewlett ah, This is all right. Huey, Huey, it's got to be Huey Lewis uh, related. <laughs> Hewlett Lewis and the not news, not blues shoes. What's in Silent Hill that's scary? Uh, everything. Yeah. <laughs> oh, that's, we can't do it, call it that though. Uh, well, that'll have to wait for later because I could do this all day. Tom, thank you so much for being on the show. Uh, me, you can follow me on Tron Knots on Twitter, and you can get reruns of the show on iTunes. There's geez, like almost 60 of them now. We've been doing it for a while. And you can watch it, rerun form, on Detroit TV. As for watching future episodes, every Sunday we're live at 1 p.m. Pacific Standard Time, 4 p.m. Eastern Standard Time on Twitch TV slash Detroit or Destructoid. Yeah, it's on the Destructoid front page. You'll find it. So anyway... Thanks so much, everybody, for watching. And thank you, Tom. Take care. Thank you.